Jane Trindle. I'm from Narrabri uh, in New South Wales. I work for the cotton industry and at um, Cotton Research and Development Corporation. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here and thank you for the invitation. Uh, fantastic to be here amongst all you guys. A really uh, incredible amount of engagement and a slightly intimidating amount of brain power in the room. But um, yeah, really exciting to be here. So I'm going to do a few things. I will talk about the RDC sector just generally, just to give you a bit of an overview of the system, and then talk about a couple of things that we're doing, particularly to enable digital innovation in agriculture. So I think a couple of trends today that have that really resonate with me. First of all, it's a bumpy ride and we've got a um, long fuse. I think we're on the long fuse and in the bumpy ride. So yesterday there was news that people were dropping predatory bugs from a drone. Today we see the, the new look of Lego with the 3, 3D printing. And I also met um, the most southern cotton grower today in Horsham. So it's just, there's just and a ridiculous amount of change and innovation happening. And I think it's great that we're all together to embrace it. So rural industries and agribusiness have a strong outlook and innovation, as it always has, lies at the heart of our competitive advantage for today and tomorrow. Despite a 50% fall in the terms of trade since 1960, Australian primary producers, our food and fibre makers, have tripled production and quadrupled the real gross value of their produce. Underpinning innovation is a successful long-term co-investment in research, development and extension through the research and development corporations. There are 15 RDCs, 10 are companies owned by the industry stakeholders and five are statutory authorities. The RDC is an independent organisation, each of which has a governing board. Collectively, the RDC is Australia's largest productivity industry innovation program, the third largest behind the National Health Medical Research Council and the Australian Research Council. RDCs are funded by industry and government. Producers, farmers, fishers and foresters pay levies for research, development and extension and in some cases market access, market development, pr promotion and other industry services. The Australian Government provides matching funds for research. And in 2015-16, the RDs collectively invested $680 million in RD&E to improve the profitability, sustainability of rural industries and communities and 60% of that figure was from industry funds. The RDC's key focus is on ensuring a return on investment for farmers, forest, foresters and fishers and the department, our investors. So in getting the results of R&D into the hands of farmers and other end users to inform their business decisions is a critical part of our business. While the RDCs themselves are a partnership between industry and government, we can't work without our research institution partners in CSIRO, the universities, the state governments and others. Um, there are many partnership arrangements in the RDC <coughs> sector, ranging from single projects through to multi-party large agreements on large issues. Um, as investment, as invest, and in particular to a particular point is that RDCs as investors were actually reliant on the research infrastructure held by our national research institutions. So no other nation has a similar system using a levy base with government co-funding to undertake research that ties industry, government and research communities. The model is the envy of the globe and is a world-class, all-encompassing network built on effective partnership and leveraged outcomes. So how we work together. There is a framework for working together in, called the National Primary Industries Research and Development Extension Framework. Uh, this framework is also under the Agriculture Minister's Forum and brings together our research partners in institutions such as the State Department, universities, CSIRO and the RDCs. There are 14 commodity plans, 14 rd &E plans for the commodities, and eight cross-sectoral issues looking at water use in agriculture, climate change, animal welfare, animal biosecurity and plant biosecurity. We also work together on projects, and this is a good example of, which, of a program which has been run by the department, 
which is really accelerated collaboration. Um, so the research, the Rural Research and Development for Profit program is a grant program. It's run by the department. It is a program worth $200 million over six years for collaborative, collaborative R&D. Um, round one and two are finished, I mean, have been funded and have funded $79 million worth of projects in 29 projects, which each average eight partners. And they've matched, had contribution, contributions of cash and in kind of $100 million. So it has been a rapid acceleration of collaborative projects in the last two years. It is a really exciting program and um, if any of you have the opportunity to get involved, I encourage you to. So just quickly, I'm now just going to change tax a little bit and talk a little bit about digital innovation. The, um, the, and what is the fuss all about? <laughs> so the application of digital innovation is one of the greatest foreseeable opportunities for transformational change in productivity growth and farm profitability. In the USA, the corn industry has shown that the use of big data to make more effective decisions on farm has delivered a 5 to 15 per cent productivity gain. The opportunity in terms of profitability across all agricultural industries cannot be overstated. Without action, Australian farmers are at risk of being left behind. So this slide, or just to explain, this slide here is a graph of, you know, really what drives R&D in agriculture generally is higher yields. And on the on my side, not very good with left and rights, is the the um, increase of cotton yields due to breeding. And then on the other side is the reduce are the increase of cotton yields due to agronomy. Now, the, the big data um, has really important implications for, the, for both breeding and agronomy and continuing this trend in cotton and, and agriculture generally. But it's the opportunities, as we've heard, are much bigger than that. There's, there's opportunities across the whole sector and across the whole supply chain. Um, this is a report, uh, a news, an article that came out just not long ago of McKinsey and talking about um, all the opportunities across the ag sector. So it's, it's a really, there's a depth of opportunity. And, you know, NFF, I think, recently said that it's the ag tech is Australia's next $100 billion industry, which, um, you know, if you think about how, where that's come from, in 2013, when Monsanto bought Climate Corp for $100 billion, that is really what sent the shock waves <laughs> around the world about the opportunity of data in agriculture. Um, and then if any of you follow Ag, follow Ag Funder newsletter, or don't, you should, it's fascinating. But in 2015, precision agriculture startups raised $661 million. Um, and then in, it's estimated in 2022 that the farm management software industry will be valued at $4 billion. So it would seem the world is awash with cash in this area. Um, the, the diagram just really explains how for our industry and probably for every industry how data is enacted on the farm. So we're really looking at collecting data, interpreting it for insights and using that possibly in robots to drive profits. This is not a shot at Monsanto. Uh, this is Monsanto's R&D spending over the last eight years. But the point is, and the quote is from their CEO, um, you know, innovation is important, but we can't do it, keep doing it the same way that we've always done it. It is getting more and more expensive. And this, this holds true for the RDCs. And the, R the data has huge potential it, with, you know, with the rise of the ridiculous rise in computing power to really transform what we can do with the money that we have available. So why, why are the RDCs getting involved and what is the problem that needs to be solved? I put this photo up here. This is a couple of growers and I hope Guy's not using it later um, from the cotton industry. And wh why is, so cotton, why is cotton in particular involved? I represent an industry full of innovators willing to take a risk and have a go. Uh, they're quite tricky actually to keep up with 
and but they are frustrated by the lack of sort of fundamental building blocks to enable digital innovation on their farm. In 2016, seems like a long but short year, um, AFI published this report, The Implications of Digital Agriculture and Big Data for Australian Agriculture, which they launched at their conference in the middle of the year. And it had nine important recommendations for, um, for the Australian ag sector generally. And in particular, there's a few of them which really resonate for the RDCs about how we engage in this issue, what's our role, um, what we do and what we don't do. So some, some critical things uh, for us were adopt the key principle that farmers own their data, make agricultural data open access, publicly fund um, cross-sectoral data, publicly fund rural and data networks, and publish open ac agricultural data open ac access. And for us not to get involved in developing commercial solutions and to think about, as we discussed earlier, that extension actually, digital transformation, digital innovation may transform in extension. Got my jargon mixed up there. <laughs> um, so what are we doing? A couple of things, we're making a plan. Under the rd &E framework, which I spoke about earlier, there's 18 uh, partners working together on a Precision Agricultural On-Farm Digital Innovation Plan, which aims to set some, a framework around how we work together to enable this area over the next three to five years. Um, it's, it's due to be finalised at the end of this year and provide a guiding platform for investment and collaboration and working together. And importantly, this year, under the Rural for Profit Projects all, uh, uh, program, all RDCs, join together with leading Australian researchers to design a big data solution for the Australian agricultural sector. Well, that's what we're aiming to do, big call. <laughs> um, we've invested $3 million over 18 months uh, to look at nine discrete areas with the fundamental aim of enabling digital innovation. So we're looking at uh, international case studies, what's happened overseas, what's worked, what hasn't, um, effective, so data rules, data systems, data communications, cross-sectoral ag data generally, economics, business models, and the way we are doing this is we're having, we're doing a producer survey, we also have got eight cross-sectoral workshops happening around the nation, based not at an enterprise, so not around a sector, but at a farming business, which we all know has multi-commodities involved in it. Um, so they kick off, I think the horticulture workshop is first kicks off in Toowoomba later this year, and they'll be happening over the next six months. I'm just, and I'm gonna go through a number of the key areas which we're addressing and just what we're hoping to achieve. Data ownership control and access. So there was a study done last year by CSIRO which showed that um, the underlying concerns of growers in relation to data relate to issues of transparency in who would be using the data, for what purpose, what value, and how are the benefits shared and distributed. America, the US have tried to, attempted to resolve this issue and last, a couple of years ago, the American Farm Bureau Federation reached agreement with 37 ag tech companies, including John Deere and DuPont, on 13 principles of data management. And there was agreement that farmers own their data. In 2016, New Zealand Farm Data Code of Practice emphasised the importance of disclosure of the rights that organisations and primary producers have in relation to farm data. Farm data is, is fairly complicated by who has collected it, where it's stored, who has access to it. It's also somewhat confused by our regulatory system in that raw data may not have a property right associated to it. So we have a team of lawyers from Griffith Uni and the University of Sunshine Coast who are reviewing the current data rules. So they're reviewing current data, ag data contracts out in the marketplace now, and then having a look in uh, around the world as to what, what we would like, to, what's, a, what's a good solution here. 
and uh, coming up with a plan to transition to that. Data systems. It's a fancy slide that someone else put together. Um, <laughs> This is just an ML, MLA slide which shows all their databases which hold a tremendous amount of data. But what they're lacking currently is an underpinning system to allow the data to intuitively move between each one and for you to look at those data sets in relation to each other. I think you know this is a frustration that many of our growers talk about having to combine the collected data from the tractor, the picker, the pump, the water monitor, the weather station, soil moisture probes, all on different interfaces and all with different data systems. So um, we have a team with the Data to Decision CRC, which will have a look at capturing the key decisions that producers want to make and the data sources that they need and to develop an ag data system. This is not the state of rural ag data. <laughs> But it may be where we've come from. And so we have CSIRO who are looking at doing an audit of ag data, particularly focused on cross-sectoral data, what we have and what we don't have, and looking at our decision support tools, what we do and what we don't have. And I mean no offence to, I can't say his name, the professor, um, whose system involves a time hierarchy of working out where in the pile his data is. But, you know, when you think about that we have 15 RDCs, all with 30 research partners over 20 years, um, it's a bit of a, it's a system that really needs sorting out. It has been done, though. It's been done in a few sectors. Fisheries are a really good example. Fisheries have done an audit of their data, have worked out their decision tree, where people would need data for what, and they have enabled um, open access to that data, which is appropriate to be. MLA are doing the same thing as other sheep CRC. So we're aiming to have a look at a ag sector wide. So we don't have 15 separate systems, but in fact, we may have sector specific systems that are all compatible with each other. I'm not going to go on about communications too much, but if I see that loading symbol one more time, I'm going to shoot someone. Uh, so data communications. I live in Narrabri, right in town, two blocks from the tower. And uh, I do get Netflix, which I think is an advantage over most of my friends. But needless to say that data communications are a fundamental stumbling block for many producers. So we have Dr. David Lamb, who uh, may be here now, or certainly be here later from UNE, who's looking at um, the current state of data communications in the country, the gaps, what the needs are, and then having a look in the future, what are those needs going to be and what are the gaps. And there are some really fascinating, innovative data solutions out there. You know, we may not need broadband. There might be some niche products. I know some of them are here today. And having a look at some of these innovative ideas to enable um, data upload and download as required. So just in summary about that project, um, this is a really exciting opportunity with the support of all RDCs to develop the most appropriate data rules, systems, sources and communications for all Australian producers to utilise ag data to enhance, enhance prof profitability while protecting the value at the farm gate. So we are aiming to increase the profitability of the sector by enabling digital ag in this project and particularly of those of the innovators which will lead, um, lead the industry. So I'm going to leave you just with this quote. This was from the Global Open Ag Data for Agriculture and Nutrition, a consortium which met in New York just a couple of weeks ago. And their, they, their brief is around open data revolution to zero hunger. And it says here, with a single smartphone app, you can now get a pretty accurate forecast of the weather anywhere in the world. And it's largely thanks to a decision by science agencies a decade ago to put online their data, satellite data, and make it for free. So we are hoping through this project that producers will be able to capture the value of their own data and we will enable the profitability of the ag sector generally. I did share the love or the load, as someone said, with putting these slides together. So just thanks to those people. They're, they're not in the room, but I really appreciate it. And thank you.
It's interesting how far down the road the R&D corporations are around um, the thinking here and the challenges and, and some of the things you raised earlier. You know, um, J Jane's really h highlighting that they're that they're along that track. They've been thinking about this a little bit. So, questions of clarification for Jane: Are there any things that you want to understand? Is there anything further that you want to add to that conversation? Now, I've got Sally and Sean down the back with um, with microphones. I think a few others. Um, so, any contributions there? Uh, in the in the puffer jacket there. A name and where you're from. I think we've had uh, you before. Ollie Magic from McLaren Vale. Um, where do startups fit in your sort of matrix of um, yeah, all the people that you work with? So can you you're hear on me? My, you're on lapel. Yeah. Um, we really see ourselves, and I actually thought I should have put a slide in about this. We're enabling startups. We are just sorting the system out so that startups don't have those barriers to entry that are currently prohibiting them from entering the space. So at this point, that's what we're focused on. And it's a good question as to how we will engage in startups in the future. And it's a question around market failure. And I don't think it's one that I've got a good answer for now. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Your time. Oh, my time's up, so <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> that wasn't your timer. <laughs> but it's a good question. So, you know, what is, what is the RDC's role around startups? And, and Jane's quite clear around this idea of market failure and, and this idea that breaking down barriers to entry is, is the steps forward there. Okay, any other questions, conversations? Yes, right here, oh, Kathleen. Just for clarification. Um, just for clarification, open access, now that doesn't necessarily mean free, does it? No. It just might be worth just clarifying the definition of that? Yeah, so open access in a number of universities, actually if you go onto their website, you can kind of see they've got this innovation web page where it's, um, it's basically a click and get a license. You know, so you can, you can package up something, we've got this excellent cotton agronomy data pack and we might put on a website and you will click the button and agree to everything that we say and you may or may not pay a small fee and you have access to use that for a certain purpose according to the licence. So, you know, you can make those licences broad and narrow. Hi, uh, Sam Trithiri from SproutX, um, which is a ad tech startup accelerator we've just launched. Um, just wanted to ask, uh, when it comes to the IP, uh, or, or is IP an issue with RDC? So when we talk about startups wanting to get access to, to a lot of the work um, that RDCs have done to commercialise that into real solutions, uh, into the supply chain or into the farm gate, um, I just would like to know a little bit more about um, is there a, a free given of, of IP into that startup that's wanting to use it or uh, is the RDC like a lot of universities want to retain ownership over that IP? Um, just if you could help me get my head around that, that'd be great. That's a good question. I think John Harvey would be, have a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like a hospital pass. <laughs> <laughs> it was a cracker. Um, look, generally that's something you need to ne negotiate with the individual RDC. The RDCs um, generally do take a position in IP and they will be looking to make sure that they use whatever assets they've got to actually return benefits to their stakeholders, particularly growers um, and farmers. So it's something that the startup would need to negotiate. But having said that, there are opportunities, I think, where RDCs and startups could actually work very effectively together. Um, to provide tools and um, technologies to farmers that um, would meet the needs of the investors as well as bring skills and expertise to bear on the task and potentially some investment in IP from an RDC. So it's certainly worth exploring. Okay, one last one. Sean, do you have one? Um, Just wait, turn it on, wait a second, it should go. How do you sell public funding of mobile and data networks as nation building and not a subsidy? So Mick Keogh's not in the room? <laughs> <laughs> not going to work twice? Uh, <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I really seriously could not answer that off the top of my head. 
We'll take that one we'll on notice, that Sean. Notice. That's a, a heck of a hospital yeah. bus. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to look forward to Mick Keo coming, so he, he can cop it tomorrow. I'll t- yeah, I'll text <laughs> him. Wednesday, Friday. Okay, well, thank you for that, Jane. That was really, really good.